Hey everyone and welcome back to another Warcraft video. So patch 8.1.5 is almost out and as compared to quite a few of the other in-between patches we have a decent amount to talk about. So let's just jump right into it. First up, allied races. So they're the most notable draw of this patch for many and yeah, it's something that has came a little bit late. Uh, we've got the Zantillary Trolls, we've got the Kul'Tearan Humans. Now leaving the lateness of these aside, they are pretty much exactly what we expected. New allied races, new unlock quest lines, another set of heritage armor for each and ultimately some new characters that will, yeah, I'd say look excellent across the board. The Kul'Tearans in particular are nice in that they're a new archetype and their shape sort of will also allow for just, you know, transmog people to get a wealth of new possibilities for them, which is pretty good. And then also their druid forms on both sides are actually pretty great, so they'll probably drive a fair few druid race changes. Of course, leveling another character or two from 20 to 120 isn't exactly new content, but it can, you know, it can drive the playtime for the alt hoarders and the transmog collecting folk. At the end of the day, it's a goal to work towards in an MMO, and uh, that's pretty effective. Now, it is worth mentioning the Zantillary Racial, which is kind of interesting, and it's a choice that Blizzard might see some pushback on. So, having the choice between so many effects, some um, extra healing, three flavors of damage, extra movement speed, and gaining health and armor on taking damage, that's actually fantastic, having the choice, and having to go to the specific Loa Shrines in Dazara Lore is actually a pretty nice bit of flavor as well. It's kind of like an evolved version of Touch of a Loon, which was the Night Elf racial that increases um, crit during the day and haste during night. That might seem really powerful to you, but it's balanced by being on a five-day cooldown, like being able to change it. So if you're, say, a you know, a, a DPS and you want to move over to tank, well, you do have to take into account that five-day cooldown for the um, selection of the lower shrine. Next up, let's talk about quests, and these actually are another positive for this patch. So, we've got our introduction to the Crucible of Storms, where we meet an old friend and learn a lot about what's going to be coming up with the game's lore. Going any further into that would be spoiler territory, but it's a decently lengthy quest line with a fairly interesting reward. We then have the finale of the patch 8.1.5 war campaign, and if you complete that on both factions, so Alliance and Horde, then you'll get two mounts, a Horde-themed horse and an Alliance-themed wolf. As for the campaigns themselves, well, look, they're very similar to what we've seen before, so it's some perfectly average quest content, uh, specifically stuff that's really just a vehicle for the faction story, but without that much interesting gameplay. So if you're interested in the character stories and following BFA's rather clumsy intrigue-filled plots as it unfolds, then yeah, you should enjoy them. It's worth mentioning that they do involve a bit more of their up-and-coming choice system, but it seems kind of superficial so far. I'd like to believe that they're either using the player data from those choices to help with their internal decision-making, or that they're planning to divide the player base in terms of what they experience eventually. Uh, because currently the player choice does kind of just boil down to a bit of lip service. It'll be nice to see more. Past that, there are some smaller quest lines too. We've got the Before the Storm tie-in quest and the Magni and Mother quest line, which is a bit of a callback to the analysis that went on around the length of the Legion patch cycles. To be frank, neither of these quests are that big. Actually, they're both really quite short. They're not really top quality questing experiences, so they're not really something to sub for. Uh, but hey, they are quests and I suppose the more bespoke content in the game, the better. And then the Before the Storm tie-in offers a mechanical parrot reward, a pet, and that's um, the one that you will have seen from the flying slide um, at BlizzCon. And then the Magni quest is the first step on our adventure to working out what can be done to help Azeroth. Then past that, for the Beastmaster Hunters, who have had a bit of a hole in their heart since the end of Legion because they lost Haiti, well, Haiti is back. Haiti's tameable and has an additional tint and can be returned to life after a pretty fun little quest line with with uh, Mimiron, Thorum, and uh, Bran, Bronzebeard. So there are even then some items on top of that that let Haiti be customized, including one that enhances Haiti's size and constitution, allowing for mounting, which is pretty cool indeed. So really, like what I've championed before, like class-specific content is always a really good thing, the type of thing that speaks to the nature of a class. That's a really good addition to the game. Being spec-specific does reduce the amount of players who can get this experience, but it does make it that bit more special. So it's definitely a good thing, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more stuff like this in the future. Now, in the note of quests, there are actually some new world quests coming. At first, there are the Naga attack quests. Basically, they're just there to add to the feeling of 8.1.5, kind of ramping up into 8.2. These quests can also grant you a 1,000 buff to a secondary stat for an hour while out in the world 
world, which is a very significant buff, actually, because, like, it's going to counteract the level scaling because, you know, it's a buff and therefore it doesn't affect the scaling. So if you grab that buff, you will feel pretty darn powerful in comparison to, uh, well, you know, the usual in Coltras and Zandalar. Then the next World Quest edition is Blizzard having a bit of a laugh at themselves. Um, in addition to some other Tortolan Seeker um, World Quests, there is one called the Cycle of Life where, uh, well, if you're sick of turtles, good. You're going to get to kill loads of them. Next up, the Brawler's Guild. It's another big fan favorite. I love it myself. And historically, it's been one of the best solo gameplay experiences for World of Warcraft. This time, there is some intrigue involved and a bit of a hint at a much larger story behind the curtain. It's another very fun quest line in a very World of Warcraft style with some courtroom drama, um, as well as the usual Brawler's Guild kind of business. Then for completing the Brawler's Guild this time around, you will get um, a big croc uh, Bruce mount, which is pretty great, and then a pretty basic but fitting transmog set. There are also cooperative mechanics that have been added using Brawler's Gold, and really the Intrigue questline as well actually might need to be covered a bit more in depth in the future, because, uh, well, it it could be hinting at a few things, let's just say. But I think definitely what I'm liking is being able to use that Brawler's Guild gold to drop down a cauldron or to purchase a, um, like a spirit healer inside the Brawler's Guild. I think that's a really nice feature and I like how it's, you know, you buy it, but it's not just for yourself, it's for everyone else. And it kind of adds to that community feel of Brawler's Guild, which is really one of the things that makes it so special. Next up, Time Walking gets a new addition this May. So Warlord's Time Walking is going to be here. It's going to breed some life into dungeons that really were tragically on underutilized. Worlds of Draenor dungeons were excellently designed, but it was an expansion early, you know, if it, did, like, it didn't have Mythic Plus, so getting to revisit them is definitely going to be fun, assuming the scaling leaves them at an effective difficulty, which it probably won't. And as with any new Time Walking edition, though, it also brings a whole bunch of appropriately themed toys and mounts. So for the mounts, we've got the Beast Lord's Iron Tusk and the Beast Lord's War Wolf, um, so a big big, tough Alec and a vicious wolf, um, each in the colors of iron and magma, which do look pretty great. Then Apex's crystals, which I'm sure we all love dearly from back in the day, do return, but uh, this time it's only one, the Apex's focusing shard, which is a light focusing toy that uh, definitely won't be annoying. There is also the banner of the burning blade for anyone who wanted the banner without the weapon um, that comes with using the Warlords of Draenor toy. And uh, yeah, this essentially brings the time walking feature to completion it's pretty doubtful that we'll see, you know, the Legion uh, things being added to Time Walking. So yeah, that essentially is all we, all we really have for Time Walking for the next while. I'd say that overall Time Walking without scaling issues is a really good addition that does give people, you know, stuff to care about. Like it gives you goals to work towards, gives you mounts, gives you toys, some content to sort of relive. It's a pretty effective way of reusing those dungeons. I just wish that at some point they would maybe put in a slightly more difficult mode. Next up, we have profession quests. So there is a large amount to talk about here, but of course, because they're profession-based quests, they're not going to be universal. So each crafting profession gets a quest line that results in the ability to create a new epic item to um, assist you with your work. These quest lines vary in quality with some like say the tailoring one being infinitely more interesting than the others. Then the items themselves also do vary in quality too with some of them being, I'd say, largely pointless, but other ones actually being quite helpful indeed. So to briefly run through them, we have Silas's Sphere of Transmutation from Alchemy that can be transmuted every hour into a reusable healing potion, a potion that increases the chance of extra alchemy items when crafting, a costume that turns you into creatures, and an item that summons an NPC that allows you to teleport to a nearby hub in your current zone. These items will persist for an hour before turning back into the sphere. Useful in varying degrees, depending on your results, I would say, with, um, you know, a fun item to have, a potential economic benefit from the extra crafted items, and then you also will get the ability to loot cauldrons in Battle for Azeroth Zones, and that will get you potions and flasks. Then blacksmiths really do get the short end of the stick. They get a hammer that can repair a piece of gear once per hour for free, and uh, then sometimes give your crafted gear the indestructible property. Basically, next to useless, even if you use the repair every hour, it's only going to save you a few gold at most, and indestructible is just not that valuable. So, yeah, I mean, sure, the only good thing is, like, what, it replaces the blacksmith's hammer with one that's purple, so you get that. Next for enchanting, there's Iwin's enchanting rod. This provides you with extra resources when disenchanting and allows you to summon in a golem combat NPC at the cost of one veiled crystal. Now having a guardian NPC might be helpful in certain situations, but 
given anyone who's going to be using this will be level 120 with a max level profession, it's not necessarily going to be useful for that much, especially at that cost. That said, extra mats from dusting certainly is nice, and I suppose it also replaces the ancient uh, rod that's been in Enchanter's bags for a very long time indeed. Next for engineers, you get the Uber Spanner. This allows you to summon in an Uber uh, construct. Unlike Reeves or Blingatron, these Ubers are combat oriented, so you've got an attack dog, you've got bomb bots, you've got an aggro taking training dummy. Not particularly useful overall, I'd say, but I guess it's just something fun to watch happen. Then for the scribes, well, there is the Sanguine Feather of Lanathel, which is a, like a pen. It allows scribes to heal from nearby corpses and lets them craft blood contracts, which are consumables that summon in combat pets in the world. Situationally useful, but of course no economic benefit, unlike with enchanting and um, the alchemy items. Then for jewel crafting, you get the Jewel Hammer's Focus. This allows you to extract gems from existing gear and interact with shrines in the world to get some free gems. Now, if we were in the era of shuffling gems around every item because every item had like three colored slots and you also maybe needed to worry about your hit and expertise caps, then this would be infinitely more useful. But as it stands, it's situationally useful, it could result in some gold saving, uh, savings if the Jewel Crafter was keeping the same set of gems throughout the expansion. Only having to buy one Kraken's Eye, I suppose, for the whole expansion is good, but other than that, it's not massively useful. Next, for leatherworking, well, you get the Mallet of Thunderous Skins, which allows for interactions with primal uh, Drums of Primal Might, which are located in the world, and interacting with those will get you a free buff. It can then also be used as a personal bloodlust on a one-hour cooldown. Given the cheapness of drums, it does seem like a pretty darn low uh, value item overall. Then for tailors, you get the synchronous thread. This lets you pick a cloth from rifts in Battle for Azeroth areas, and more importantly, resurrect if you die out in the world, which is very handy. So there you go. Overall, I think a mixed bag. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Personally, I wish more of it was focused on the economy design of the professions. Then next up, we've got the Crucible of Storms, which comes in patch 8.1.5. It's a new raid, and it will launch five weeks after the patch releases. It slots right in between Dazar lore and whatever will come after the 8.2 launch, and it drops items slightly higher in item level than Dazara lore. As a raid, it seems to be quite high quality, as I think is the norm from the visible tester feedback, which is almost nothing new for World of Warcraft. It's almost always had excellent raid design. What is new, though, is that every piece of loot has some form of interesting give or take style effect representing the nature of the raid and symbolizing the relationship between players and an Azoth. And it's actually quite a brave step, as anyone could see that these effects, like they would have the potential to cause harm in a pug raid, and their usefulness ultimately is something that relies on tuning that is a lot more difficult to do than just lumping a stat budget on an item. However, it does seem to be intended to solve community problems, uh, you know, issues that people have had with gear for quite a while, namely the uniqueness and the importance of individual bits of loot. This could be the first step on a path to far more interesting loot in World of Warcraft, which really would be fantastic. Then narratively, it actually is quite great um, as a raid that really just serves the, well, serves the purpose of bridging the gap between 8.1 and 8.2 and prepping players for what's to come in terms of the story. So quite similar to Trial of Valor in terms of the size of the raid, but narratively, I think it's actually put to better use. Next up, for PvPers and players of Wrath of the Lich King, Wintergrass returns as an epic battleground. Sadly, though, it loses some of its merit because, of course, you know, the the instance Wintergrasp has no effect on Vault of Archivon access or anything like that, but it is largely, you know, what you know. It's Wintergrasp, large scale siege combat, some loved and some hated. Personally, I really enjoyed it. If it works cleanly, there could be the potential for Tol Brad and potentially even Ashran to join Epic Rattle, uh, Battlegrounds sooner rather than later, which would be quite good too. Then as for the regular PvPers, well, AB and WG have had their visual revamp. They play identically, but look a bit more 2019 and a bit less 2004. Then for 815, it also is bringing the Erythai Comp Stomp Brawl. This puts a team of players against the team of AI. Now, this is their first attempt at using the Island Expedition AI outside of its original context, with the main difference being that the AI now has like a full player character toolkit. Overall, I see this as Blizzard testing the waters. This could open up a battleground sort of experience to a PvE audience, which certainly would be interesting as long as they don't mind fight, uh, facing more lifelike sort of enemies. 
but it could be the start of island AI being used elsewhere, maybe for zone-like specific threats or for rare mobs, which could be quite promising. Next, the Dark Moon Fair has got some small upgrades. You've got the janky Dark Moon roller coaster now being available. You've got some balloon pets and then faction colored severed fish head hats. Now, the roller coaster simply is an alternative to the carousel, costing the same ride ticket and giving you the same buff. However, when you think about it in a more meta way, well, the Dark Foon Fair has all these eyes everywhere and it's being upgraded as we're delving deeper into the Crucible of Storms. And really, we're just in a time where more questions are going asked but are being unanswered. So you have to wonder, are they connected? I mean, come on, we're getting fish heads that are like sort of eating players' heads as our reward here. It just all seems a bit coincidental in terms of timing. Really, we do see that even the smaller aspects of this patch are hinting at Nazoth, which is pretty cool. Then we also have the portal debacle, which has been just the big old thing, but basically here's what's essentially happened. There are new consolidated portal hubs in Stormwind and Orgrimmar. Now, the good thing about these is they're really convenient. They're really well placed, they actually look quite nice, and they feel a lot more designed than the previous way of things, which was just having portals strewn across the place. Each portal hub has one portal per expansion, with some of them being a little bit odd, like the Legion one takes you to Azuna instead of Dalaran, the Pandaria one takes you to Powdon Village instead of to the Vale, which is a bit odd because, let's be real, if you're going to Legion, you probably want to go to Dalaran, and if you're going to Pandaria, you're probably going to the Vale. And that's just one odd thing that is kind of typical of a lot of oddness that's happened, because they've also really removed a lot of portals from the game. So many of the Dalaran portals are now gone, so your Dalaran Crater, your, um, uh, your Caverns of Time, those portals have been removed, basically all that stuff that was underneath Dalaran, and just broadly they've cut down a lot of portals in the game. So overall this has been done with the goal of making the world feel larger. Of course they have just made the world feel larger by reducing your ability to travel around the place, and it really is an interesting discussion that is beyond the remit of this video. All I'd say is this, if you want people to care about the world, what you should really do is make them care about the world. So have content in that world. Maybe the faction war across the two continents, that thing that we saw in the, the start of the trailer for BFA, maybe that should actually be something that is reflected by stuff going on in the regular zones. Maybe then people would actually care about the zones. Um, instead of just making everything slow. If you take a game like, say, Guild Wars 2, that's a game that feels really quite large and expansive indeed, yet it has the, basically a, you can teleport anywhere you've been to, uh, fast travel system. So I think there's a lot of stuff they need to think about there. What I'll say is this, the portal rooms are really nice, they do act as a good basis for the future, but um, I think that they kind of bungled their execution in other ways. Now, on the topic of miscellaneous stuff, well, at long last, heirlooms can now be upgraded to 120 as of this patch, speeding up that, um, those, those last 10 levels by a significant margin. Running islands or autopiloting through the now familiar quests with a full suite of heirlooms will really allow you to turn that stack of 110s into 120s in no time, especially since Seafarer's uh, doubloons can now be traded for expedition gear, which will give you item level appropriate uh, gear when used, the tokens, and that's actually great. It helps the island levelers get geared as they go, and it's nice to see Blizzard attempt to support an unconventional or unintended playstyle instead of, well, trying to destroy its viability straight up. Then past that, the character limit per server has went from 18 to 50, so if you're a Realm Loyalist and you really want every character on your home server, you are now completely free to do that. The only thing to take from this is that the limitation there was not a technical thing, and that really some people really must love leveling their allied race characters on the same server. 18 is a lot of characters for that to not be enough. Then there's also some minor holiday changes, so Children's Week is getting four new pets, and then the children um, for the Xantelarion Kalterian uh, are being taken under the wing of the Alliance and Horde Matrons, so that's what's going on for Children's Week. I suppose it's a tiny little touch that could have easily been overlooked, but wasn't. Then the Trial of Style is also returning with this patch. We're getting new ensembles that are Cataclysm Dungeon themed, and uh, there's also maybe some spooky lore going on behind it too. Then in addition to that, there are the new Micro Holidays with the Wanderers Festival, the Luminous Luminaries, and the Free T-Shirt Day, uh, which have been added. Soon, really, there's not going to be in, like a calendar day that's empty at this stage. Then, Raiding with Leashes is also getting a new step that's set in Pandaria for those who are hungry for the pet battles. I hear it's actually really good quality content, and as your reward, you will get Happiness the pet. So to round this up, 815 is, I think, mixed. On paper, there's a lot of stuff happening, and it took a long time to get through it. It's just a shame that so little of it impacts the core game of World of Warcraft. And really, WoW's an interesting beast. It offers more and more engagement in different ways, 
while some of the sort of long-term drivers of the game are kind of suffering. And I think that goes some way to help explain the apparent community divide. With a community as large as what this game has, there are just so many different types of players, and it appears that at least a few types of players will be thrilled with the content that is arriving in this patch. There is lots of stuff to do if you want to farm some mounts, if you want to tame some battle pets, or, um, you know, just do world stuff. There's a new raid coming to prepare for, and although small, it is lined up to be a pretty great gameplay experience. There are some small quest lines to enjoy, and while the core systems of the game are visibly hurting from the missteps and failed experiments of BFA, there's, I mean, th there's a lot of stuff for players to enjoy if they opt into it and if that's their intention. It helps, I think, that some steps are being taken to right the wrongs that some players feel, but ultimately, I think it's an interesting patch because technically, it has a bunch of stuff, even though, really, it kind of doesn't at the same time. And I think it's where the infinitely replayable content stuff comes up, like Mythic Plus and Islands and the engagement loop of Titan Forging. Really, there are, a lot, there are things that just don't seem to take that much effort to add to over time. They, in theory, can keep the core players and the core of the game going indefinitely. Maybe Blizzard thought they'd be able to do that, and that that would mean that they would be free to add more esoteric content, like what is seen in this patch. But I think, as the response to World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth has shown, that plan is not working out. For whatever reason, that core, infinitely replayable content does not seem to be having the long-lasting appeal that Blizzard thought it would. And because they made that assumption and they made their plans off that assumption, they're now in a pretty rough spot. And they're not in an enviable position. I mean, they've got all these people who are trying their best, trying to put out great work on all fronts, but it just seems like because the core of the game is kind of missing, a lot of that ends up going to waste. It's an interesting topic for sure, and I think that more of the core concerns are really what patch 8.2 is targeted at. From everything that I've heard of that patch, I mean, not to count, you know, sort of, was it count our chickens before they roost or something? Not to do that, but it seems like if you want more interesting world content and really the stuff that I am personally interested in, which let's be real, is not most of this patch, then 8.2 really is the, the thing to be looking forward to. But anyway, there you go. Let me know what you think about all this stuff down below. Are you coming back for 8.15? Are you waiting until 8.2? Are you just waiting for the next expansion? I'd be pretty interested to hear where you are with Battle for Azeroth and indeed, like, what are the changes and features that you think could bring you back? So let me know down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.